Buongiorno. Let's have a look at large signal response of a PN diode. So, within the uh, scope of the course, uh, we're now at the large signal response of a PN diode. We're going to look at digital switching of such devices. And in the last segment, we had looked at small signal AC response, where we derived an equivalent circuit model. And that equivalent circuit model consisted of, out of a series resistance, a conductance, and two capacitors. Uh, the junction capacitance was acting really fast, and the diffusion capacitance was limited by the carrier diffusion. A couple of lectures back, I uh, chose to show you a sort of an equivalent um, of a body of uh, water that is being filled by uh, a river and that can have um, generation um, by rain and evaporation, etc. Now, I like to um, appeal to your sort of f physical intuition that um, this large body of water uh, will probably not react extremely fast if you were somehow able to reverse the flow of the river. You can imagine that there will be uh, some as you reverse it, there will be some longitudinal um, uh, change uh, in a wave that you can detect, but the body uh, of water will not suddenly empty out. So, just like that, a, a capacitor cannot just empty out, and there will be a response time, and that response time will probably have to do with a slower diffusion capacitance in the system rather than the really fast um, dielectric response that we have seen um, on, on one part of the AC response. So, that being said, we're going to introduce something called the charge control model, and then look at on and off uh, characteristics, and then rederive the PN diode equation from this charge control model. So, that being said, let's step forward and sketch again this IV that we have seen before. And imagine that we have a certain bias here, and we, uh, uh, at first, just for argument's sake, we, we ramp down the bias really slowly, and we imagine that the system can respond. Uh, and it just follows roughly the IV as if um, there was um, nothing, it's just like a DC response. But let's imagine we have a digital circuit where we can switch uh, the um, the um, the signal rather rapidly, and what would we measure on the uh, on the diode? So let's imagine that uh, we actually transition very fast and change the signal on the diode really fast. So what happens is actually the diode uh, responds in a way that doesn't follow the exact DC IV. In fact, the voltage will stay constant for a while and the, um, the current can change sign. So that is analogous, in a sense, to the potential energy in our, uh, in our lake cannot just dramatically change. So the potential in the lake cannot change uh, instantaneous, but you can change the flow uh, by valves uh, overall. But the overall response will be uh, slow. Okay, and same in the reverse direction, if you switch from a, a large negative bias to a large positive bias, actually the current will change uh, at the entrances, so to speak, but uh, the overall potential in the device will have to uh, change uh, more slowly in time. So we'll, we'll talk about those different times, and you can kind of keep this classical model in mind. So, Current can flip instantaneous, but the voltage changes slowly. Okay, so let's uh, let take a uh, closer look at this fast uh, transition region. So uh, imagine uh, you want to plot the voltage and the current separately. So here we have a transition as a function of time, and we're plotting the voltage that is on the diode, and we're going to plot the current that is flowing through the diode. So again, as a function of time here, and as a sketch here, that for a certain uh, uh, amount of time, current has been flowing 
in one direction and we suddenly switch it and find that the current has switched directions. So it's migrating like this uh, um, and has a, a changes in instantaneous here, the sign, and then over a certain time TS uh, maintains that current and the voltage is decaying slowly over this time TS. Okay, And then uh, voltage turns negative here and current gets smaller over so-called recovery time. So it goes to the desired um, DC bias result. Okay, so let's step through this again. Before the transition occurs, we are here in the yellow dot, here in the current and here. Now as we um, change uh, the overall signal on the diode, the current will switch. We're on the green dot, but the voltage hasn't switched yet. And then eventually we reach, uh, um, uh, after time TS, a storage time, we reach, uh, uh, keep the constant, uh, current constant, and then uh, change the voltage slowly. All right. So we have a storage time, a recovery time, and a reverse recovery time. And we'll go through these times and calculate those in, in a model that is called a charge control model. All right. In the ideal world, we would like to, of course, solve the semiconductor equations. We, and, but in, in general, that is uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to do for large signals. And what is being introduced is something called this charge control model. So rather than dealing with um, the, uh, the overall electron distribution in uh, a significant amount of detail, what you do is uh, you lump up the electron charge that is on the minority carrier side and lump it up in, say, an electron charge and look at the overall charge that is in your capacitive element, like this lake. And you do the same for the holes. So let's carry this forward a little bit. These are called the charge control expressions or equations. Um, and you introduce those uh, as approximations because it's really hard to get analytical ex expressions. And remember, a, a lot of this was done in the 50s uh, where there is no computing. And again, we're doing this to gain insight into the device rather than numerical accuracy. Of course, today you can solve these things uh, with computers, with uh, programs to a, a high degree of accuracy, but you may not have the insight that you get from analytical expressions. All right, so how does it happen that the current flips without um, a voltage flipping at all? Okay, so let's c uh, consider uh, the forward bias right now. Uh, we'll start with that and then eventually we'll sw switch the signal. So we had calculated in the past that as you are here on the minority side, same axis here, so call that zero, that we have minority carriers that are injected uh, on the P side and they decay in length uh, away from the junction. And uh, if there is uh, recombination, we know uh, this curve looks exponential and these carriers are dying out exponentially. Okay, so let's assume that we now apply a, a rapid uh, 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 signal on this device. What happens? Well, you cannot change overall the charge distribution in this device, but right at the edge here you can nibble away at the charge that is available and that can, in that region, can diffuse into the other direction. And then as time goes on, you lose charge and overall the charge is then beginning to um, trickle into the, back to the majority carrier side. So the minority carrier electrons are then going back to the junction. Okay. So where did the charge go? It goes back to the left side and recombines with traps or it, it goes all the way through into the majority carrier side, okay? So what you can have as a concept here is you can keep track of this charge as an integral quantity. The minority carriers throughout the majority side, so the electrons on the P side, 
you can uh, consider them as one body of charge and keep track of it that way. Okay, so there's sort of a time evolution of this overall distribution and we keep track of the content of the distribution. Now, how do you change sign? Well, we have in our diffusion expressions that the current is really the slope at this point zero here, right? So, at uh, the switching time, just before dn dx is less than zero, so the electron flow is going, the electron flow is going this way, the current is going the other way, and due to the time it takes for the carriers to drain out, only the slope changes right here on that interface, and therefore current can change sign. So current can respond instantaneously, but the charge that is under this curve, the distribution of carriers, can only change at the edges. Okay, so let's carry this uh, calculation through a little bit. So we, here we are, we have the um, uh, current continuity equation on the top left, and we have the drift diffusion equation on the right. Let's assume that we don't have carrier generation, and that we don't have an electric field that is uh, uh, on this side, on the, on the um, P side with the minority carriers. And we're going to write down the uh, char electrons, again, as the electrons under um, under equilibrium conditions, and then the minority carrier excess concentration delta n. Okay, so we'll carry this delta n around. And we'll carry the, the usual um, diffusion equation that we have looked in in the past. So we look at the time evolution of this excess carriers with a diffusion coefficient, and we have already derived that this excess carrier rate is going to a decay in time with a minority carrier lifetime. So this expression should become rather familiar to you by now. All right, let's look at this expression. We're going to integrate this overall expression on the left and the right uh, in x and along from, from 0 to the length wp. Okay, that'll give us the total charge that's in the system if we multiply with q and the area a. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to integrate this charge, uh, uh, this expression on the left and on the right. So nothing fancy has happened yet. All we did is we multiply also by Q and by A. Okay? All right. So now we identify that this total integral running from 0 to WP over just delta N is the stored charge that is in the a majority carrier side. So that's the, the total excess charge delta n integrated over the whole region. Okay? We identify that with Q. Okay? So we pulled it uh, DDT out of here and we end up with a Q and we look up uh, what is happening to these expressions here. Okay? So clearly this translates into this. And we associate the first term uh, here with current going out and the second term with the current going in to the device at particular sites, okay? So we did the, the integral um, over this term and then we have an integral expression on the left boundary of the, uh, the top boundary of the integral and on the bottom of the integral. So now we have two terms in there of the, of the integrand and we have, of course, the recombination term as well. So we can identify this expression now as a, in a form like this, where we look at the total charge as a, t a function of time as the difference current of current going into the system and uh, going out and of the relaxation time. So the total charge that is building in the system is the net electrons flowing in minus the recombination. Okay, it's again a rate expression for the overall charge in the system. All right, so that's the charge control model. It's, it's really, in a way, the, the classical analog of water in the system. So it's very similar, except you have, you know, something called recombination. You can find the equivalent classical model for water as well. 
Now we're going to look at uh, turning the devices off and on and derive some expression for it. I'll do that in the next section. See you then.